Hi guys, my name is Vince. For my whole life, my career has been a high performance automotive metal fabricator. I did what all the kids say they want to do. When I grew up, I built race cars. In the past few years, I've learned to integrate hobby machines into my prototyping and workflow with pretty fantastic results. Recently, I've been given the chance to become part of the team at Saunders Machine Works and work with Proven Cut on the hobby side. That's where we take a variety of materials and we put them in these machines and we develop cut recipes that are reliable, repeatable, and efficient. Good feeds and speeds are very important for hobby machines like this because as you can see, they're not the fastest machines and they're definitely not the strongest. That doesn't mean we can't learn a few tips and tricks along the way. There came a point in time where I decided that in order to level up and keep growing as a fabricator that it would be a good idea to buy my own little machine. My first CNC was a shape oko just like this. However, I didn't have a nice fixture plate or low profile mod vices or even a tool length offset probe. I bought mine just to make sheet metal parts at first and I kind of quickly started pushing the limits. I became known as that guy that would pretty much try and cut anything. Nom, 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 nom. In fact, my first 3D aluminum project was a twin turbo Viper intercooler. And I machined the end tanks. These are wood samples. It's actually one of my first 3D machined wood pieces ever. I don't do too much wood. <laughs> it's just not shiny. That's about it. <laughs> so the material weight for that project was around 60 pounds, if I remember correctly. And let me tell you, failure is a great teacher on something like this because these machines are awesome. They do exactly what you tell to do, which is also the worst part because it will do exactly what you tell it to do. Today we're going to focus on the Tormach XS Tech router. It has an 8.5 by 6.5 by 2.4 work area, a 5,000 to 20,000 high RPM spindle, a bell drive with 120 inch per minute rapid, and the main unit is only 33 pounds and actually has handles on the side, which is important to me because that means it maintains its portability. Well, let's see what it's made of. As you can see, it is fully enclosed and that can be important in a garage or classroom type environment. It does come with its own computer, running Tormox Pathpilot, and it does have a touchscreen. Tormox uses Pathpilot for all its CNC machines. So once you get comfortable using the XS Tech router, you could step up to say 1100MX without a problem. The mouse and keyboard are silicone covered and are waterproof and chip proof. It also comes with a jog shuttle, which I personally really like. Usually you'll be zeroing with paper, so it really helps you get up close and personal with the machine. And probably the most important part, the e-stop. We've all had to use it at one point or another. It's really nice for the machine to come with one. This is a Wax's stepper force test. When I figure out feeds and speeds, I input my materials K factor to estimate the cut forces. Maximum force is one of the factors I use to figure out a machine's sweet spot. As you can see, this one hits about four and a half pounds. It comes with a complete end mill kit. The four millimeter shank size maintains a good balance between spindle power and rigidity. Basically, if you can't cut it with the end mills provided, you probably shouldn't be cutting it, and they are pretty good quality. The top question most people ask is, how well can it cut aluminum? I'm here to show you that it can most definitely cut 2D, 3D shapes, and engrave with realistic cam, and proper feeds and speeds. We also ran oak, delrin, and brass to test the machine and other materials. All right, folks, I think it's time to make some chips. First, we install the mod vise on the Saunders Machine Works tooling fixture plate, and then we're gonna clamp in a piece of 6061 aluminum that eventually is gonna become a T-net. Once the part was designed in Fusion 360, one of the first steps is to go into the Manufacturer tab and create your setup. Usually you'd come right to here and make a new setup. However, I already have one, so I'm just going to show you what's in it. I created my setup stock right here, and I oriented my part so that I could actually cut all the way through without cutting into the side where my mod vices are holding the stock. 
my origin point, x, y, z, is in the corner, and that's where I zero my part, x, side to side, y, front and back, z, up and down. Next we'll use the integrated tool length offset probe to update the offset, and then we'll zero the z using the paper method. My x and y are already zeroed. The drag shuttle is pretty nice for this in my opinion. Our first tool path will be a 2D face. If you look at our setup stock, you'll notice our part is located near the bottom. So we'll use that 2D face to machine from the setup stock top to the model top. The tool we'll be using is a 4mm single fluid end mill, and this is the same tool we're going to be using for the complete project. I really like using single fluid end mills for higher PM machines because they take less power than say a 2 or a 3 flute to run. They self-evacuate chips pretty well, and you can take a pretty decent chip load most of the time. We'll be running this end mill at 20,000 RPM with a cutting feed rate of 40 inches per minute. That will give us a feed per tooth of 2 thousandths of an inch. We will be cutting at multiple depths of 5 thousandths of an inch with a step over of 0.1 inches, and I believe that's a little bit above 60% of the end mill diameter. There is a finishing step of 2 thousandths of an inch, at a finish feed rate of 20 inches per minute and that gives us a feed per tooth of 1 thousandths of an inch. As you can see we'll be cutting climb only and mainly that's because I've found in these smaller machines a climb only cut will usually give you a more consistent shinier facing finish. One of the last important things to check is right here extend before retract and what that means is your tool is going to actually travel all the way across your stock before it retracts and links. If you don't do that, your tool won't travel all the way across and you'll be left with some machining marks at the very end. Now that the facing is done, let's get to the roughing. A 3D adaptive clearing strategy was chosen, mainly because it gives you a little bit better control over the boundaries and the rest machining from setup stock. As you can see, I used a pretty low depth of cut, but a pretty healthy step over. Right now it's about 50% step over, just so I didn't have to deal with chip thinning or anything like that. We'll run the tool at 20,000 RPM, at a cutting feed rate of 40 inches per minute, with a 2 thou feed per tooth. The optimal load is 80 thou, with a roughing step down depth of cut of 10 thousandths. We'll leave 10 thou stock to leave axial and radial which means we'll leave 10 thou everywhere to clean up with finishing passes. With these speeds and feeds, the machine force in the cut is about half a pound, and I've found this machine to generally like around half a pound to one pound for roughing. But usually I'll stay on the conservative side just because it's easier to let the machine just work and not have to worry if you're going to skip a step or a belt or anything like that. Now that the roughing is done, it's time to do some finishing. This time we'll use a 2D contour toolpath. And as you can see, we're ramping it down and it's taking a depth of cut of 10 thou per step. The end mill RPM is 20,000. and We'll be running at a cutting feed rate of 20 inches per minute for a feed per tooth of 1,000. That's a pretty light cut for a finishing cut because remember we're only taking off the additional ten thousandths that we left from the roughing. For nice sidewall finishes on small machines like this, I like to use this constant ramping because I feel like it gives you a better surface finish because the tool pressure and tool load is pretty constant compared to a full depth wall cut. I know it's not as exciting though. Remember folks, adaptive is not a finishing strategy, so we left 10,000 axial and radial to be cleaned up with contour passes. Second to last, we have a boring operation. This one can be a little tricky just because the hole size is pretty close to the end mill size. It needs to be tapped for a M6 by one, so the hole size is a little under 0.2 and uh, our four millimeter end mill equals about 0 0.157 so as you can see not a huge difference in diameter there. We'll be running the end mill at 20,000 rpm with a cutting feed rate of eight inches per minute. I usually use pitch to determine my bore but I know some people like to use ramp angle. One important thing is repeat passes and that means you're going to take a spring pass 
Another important thing right here in the leads and transitions is lead to center. And that means after the cut's done, it's going to go to the center and it won't try and uh, just go right up a wall. At this point, all the important surfaces on the part are within tolerance. So all that's left for me to do now is to run a 2D contouring operation and free the part from the stock. The strategy is pretty much the same as the other 2D contouring operation. Still running at 20,000 RPM, cutting feed rate of 20 inches per minute with a feed per tooth of 1,000. Still cutting in multiple depths and ramping around the part. Uh, a little lower depth than the other finishing operation because as we get to the bottom of the part, it's going to engage 100% of the cutter. So I wanted it to have a little bit less load on it. And here's that cut in action. As you can see, it's finishing the walls. And as it cuts down, it'll be full with slotting, which isn't a problem for a single fluid end mill. And we leave a very thin onion skin. So there you go. After a little bit of deburring, we have a pretty nice part that's ready to be tapped. In conclusion, I can definitely see this machine in the classroom or at home with younger kids who want to learn CNC. With its belt drive and low power, it's almost maintenance free and virtually unbreakable. The PathPilot software is very powerful and easy to use. Now if you'd like to maximize your material removal rate, it's best to use constant load tool paths like Fusion 360's Adaptive. Because it's not a super rigid machine though, we'll have to stay with low axial depths of cut and kind of work your way down. Depends on what kind of material cutting. I probably wouldn't buy this machine to cut steel. Just saying. Well thanks for watching folks. Until next time.